you know, for me, and not for everybody, but for me, Christmas is a, a warm season, and I enjoy, and I enjoy a lot of the traditions of Christmas. And um, anyway, I just, there's so much of it um, that I like, but I, and I know that a lot of people like a lot of the traditions of Christmas, and, and I know this is something you've heard before, but in all that tradition and all, and all the warm fuzzies of Christmas, it's, um, it's easy to miss the message of Christmas, and I know, I, know you, I know you know that. And it's, it's almost cliche. You've, you've probably heard this. It's even on Christmas cards, right? Jesus is the reason for the season, right? You've heard that. And that's, that's true. And, um, but it's, it's become almost cliche. But cliches happen because they're true. Uh, if I were to ask you or ask most people, especially Christians, I guess, obviously, um, what the message of Christmas is, uh, that most people would say, well, Jesus, or the birth of Jesus, something to do with Jesus, right? And that's, that's a good Sunday school answer, right? Because when you're in Sunday school, the answer to every question is Jesus, right? You just answer Jesus, you're going to get most questions right. And, and it, is, it is correct. So I don't want to take away from that, but, um, but today we're going to look actually what a little more specifically, okay, what more specifically is the message of Christmas? Because I would say that, that Jesus is, is like the, the person of Christmas, right? Um, but there's a, a Christmas message. And I want to I wanna look at that today uh, because the angels announce this message. It, it, you, you all, most of you know that you all know the Christmas story and uh, found in Luke 2. And the angels came to deliver a message. And yes, it was about the birth of Christ, but, but they got more specific. But they, it started this way in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Um, so the angels appear to the shepherds. And uh, how many of you, you, maybe some girls were, but you guys in Sunday school, if, if you grew up in the church, you were the shepherd, right? Any, any, any young men get to be, ever get to be Joseph? No Josephs out there? No. Y'all had to be shepherds, right? Robert Schmidt and I went to the same church. You were probably a shepherd, weren't you? Uh, for like 17 years or what? I don't know. And, <laughs> and the girl that got to be Mary, you know, in her little blue, you know, sheet, you know, wrapped around her and it's a little baby doll that, you know. And if you, if you didn't make the Mary cut, then you were the angel, Right? With a little pipe cleaner and around your head and the, and the glitter and everything. Yeah, so anyway, back, I digress. So, the angels appear to the shepherds. Luke 2.10. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The word good news, actually bring good news, is one word in the Greek language. Greek is the original language of the New Testament. Okay, that's what the, the people that wrote the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament wrote in Greek because that was the worldwide language at that time. So the word, with one Greek word for bring good news, it's uh, what Greeks would say, because they don't say V's, so like in India they don't say V's, it's U's. They would say, uh, uh, almost sounds Italian, Ugalitso. We would say evangelizo. Um, I'm still not pronouncing that right, but that's okay because I'm not a Greek scholar. It's where we get our word evangelize, right? You've heard the word evangelize or evangelist or evangelism. That means bring good news. An another word for uh, ugalitso uh, is in the Bible, other than evangelize, is gospel. You've heard that word, right? Gospel is bring good news. And so they could have said, we, uh, we bring you the gospel today, right? Bring good news. Um, and it says, cause great joy for all people. So what is this good news? I mean, it's like, well, the birth of Jesus. That's, yeah, that's news and that's good news, but what makes it good news? All right? Because just, just somebody being born, especially if they're like mean and angry, 
is not good news. <laughs> so what is the good news? Um, well, the angel that announced this gives us the answer. To, to, it's really the message of Christmas. Here it is, Luke chapter 2, verse 13. So just go down a little ways. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. There it is right there. That's, that's the message of Christmas, and that's our main point for this morning, is this, that Jesus came to give you peace. So it's not wrong to say the message of Christmas is the birth of Jesus. That is not wrong. It's just not real specific. What's more specific about the message of Christmas is that Jesus came to bring you, you, and really every human, but let's make it personal, you, bring you peace. <laughs> and that in itself sounds so cliche. I mean, again, because true things become cliche. You know what cliche means? It's just like you've heard it so many times it almost loses its meaning. I, I remember, I mean, I can see the Christmas cards, you know, you get hundreds of them over the years, like, like blue background and peace on earth and glittery, glittery letters, you know, across there. And how many, how many peace on earth Christmas cards have you got? Well, and that's good, because that's biblical, that's the message of Christmas, but we hear it so much, it's like, do we really stop and think, what is it, okay, what does that mean? How does that, how does that impact me, or does it, does it even impact me? So, because when we talk about peace, I think there's so many people that don't understand the type of peace that Jesus brings. And he, and he, t he tells us this in John 14, 27, Jesus says this, talking to y'all, he says, peace I leave with you. He's ready to go back to heaven. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and not be afraid. So he's saying, I'm giving you a different peace than the world gives. See, the world would mainly think that peace is lack of conflict. Right? If, if there's no conflict, we have peace. That's what the world would say. That's a secular meaning. But, our, and we'll talk about this in a minute, the biblical meaning for peace is a lot different than just lack of conflict. But it's interesting when Jesus talks about, I, um, the angels say first, um, peace, goodwill towards men. And then Jesus says, you know, 30, 33 years later, I'm leaving peace with you, like my peace, not the world peace. I'm leaving my peace with you. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about Jesus, and he called him the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, right? He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. And uh, so, that, so this whole idea that God would be peace, or Jesus would, would be uh, the Prince of Peace, uh, came a long time before Jesus came. So, Jesus came to make it possible for you to have peace with God so that you could have the peace of God. Okay? We're gonna, and and, and that's, that's the order of how things have to go. If you want this peace, peace that we're going to talk about here in a minute, you, you need, first you need to have peace with God before you can have the peace of God. Um, and Jesus makes that possible. When Jesus made, brought, made it possible for us to have peace with God, he, he didn't just call for some uneasy truce. Like, hey guys, you know, quit Quit rejecting God. Just be nice to God, and God, you know, don't don't smite them anymore. Just you guys could just get along, all right? That's not that's not the message of Jesus. It wasn't some uneasy truce that, like, hey, just get along, all right? That that wasn't his message. He restored us back into fellowship that had been broken with God. This close personal fellowship that had been has had been broken and still is broken with a lot of people. 
because God wanted that. Because the message of the angel was peace, goodwill toward men. And you've seen that again a hundred times on a Christmas card, maybe a thousand if you're old like me. Not like Janiel, but if you're old like me. Um, so, um, goodwill towards men, what does that mean? Actually, it's like, how can I say it? It's for God's pleasure. So you could say it this way, or I would say it this way. When the angels announce peace, like Jesus is born to bring peace into your life, and he's doing it because it's, it's for the pleasure of God. And we think, well, he's bringing us peace, good for us, and it is good for you. And it is for you. But it's done, and in the, in the announcement of the angels, it's done because God wanted it. He wanted that. It's, it's for his good pleasure. And depending on what translation you read, I think maybe NIV says, for his, or maybe they say favor. I think uh, the favor of God. Um, some uh, translations say pleasure of God. New King James that I'm reading out here uh, says uh, goodwill. God has goodwill towards you. That's, that's a revelation in itself to a lot of people. I mean, like, I mean, God's not mad at me? No, that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. And God's never been wrathful against people. Personally, he's been wrathful against sin and evil. That's what he, but, but and he still doesn't like that. But, but Jesus came to give us, to restore us back into relationship with God the Father. Because God the Father wants that. It's not like Jesus is begging, Dad, they're sorry. They said they're sorry. Can you just... Treat them nicely, Dad. I mean, that's not how, like, the Father's like, Jesus, you need to go reconcile these people to me. That's my greatest desire. For my pleasure, I would love to have these people, my people, reconcile to me. And that's what Jesus came to do. That's what goodwill towards men means. So I, uh, we talk about this peace, when, uh, especially in the Old Testament, when um, uh, Isaiah says he'll be called the Prince of Peace. In the Old Testament, which is Hebrew, uh, the word for peace is shalom. Most of you have heard the word shalom. A lot of you know what it means. Maybe some of you don't. So it's shalom in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, which is Greek, it's uh, Irene. Anybody have a name, Irene? I don't think there's any... Oh, Kathy, that's right. I remember I ask this every year. Uh, the, the name Irene comes from the Greek word Irene, which is peace, which is the same as the Old Testament word shalom. And shalom, or Irene, is not just lack of conflict. It's much more rich than that. Shalom would be like... Um, yeah, it's peace and lack of conflict, but it's well-being, it's satisfaction, it's health, physical health, it's prosperity, um, tranquility. It's all of that wrapped into one. I mean, the, the word shalom is so rich and so encompassing. It just like covers so many things. Like oh, I'm tranquil, I'm satisfied, I'm I'm at peace. I'm I feel I'm like there's well-being. I, I, I feel like God's keeping me healthy and, work, and working in my health and, and he's providing for me and we rest in that. And like, that's shalom. And that's what Jesus came to give you. And, and the only way you're going to have that is first to have peace with God, which Jesus came to do, so you can get the peace of God, this Shalom. I think, which is just my opinion, right? I think that most people, including a lot of Christians, have never really, really received the message of Christmas. Because if they did, they would have shalom. Wouldn't they? I mean, did, did the Bible, all the prophets said, 
the Prince of Peace is coming to give you peace. He's coming to give you shalom. That tranquility, that sense of well-being, that satisfaction, that... Jesus came to give you that. I'll just say it. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm getting old enough now I can start saying things. Like, if, if, if you don't have that, you've missed the message of Christmas. And you think you have a message, a message of Christmas because, well, the message of Jesus Christ and his birth. Well, good for you. A six-year-old knows that. That sounds kind of harsh, but okay. Grumpy old man, go away. Nice guy. Um, <laughs> We've got to get this message of Christmas, of peace, on earth, which means you. Peace, the shalom, the peace that passes understanding. <sighs> so many people's lives are full of anxiety and chaos and, and I know you see it I see it all the time I, I, if, if we could wipe anxiety and chaos out of people's lives I would I could be a part time pastor like really part time like maybe an hour and a half a week preaching here but because, but because that's not true I, I stay pretty busy helping people with their anxiety and chaos and sometimes I have to help myself <laughs> like yesterday, <laughs> I lost my peace for a little bit and, and I had to get it back. <laughs> my wife had to help me do that a little bit, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, so what does the Bible teach us about peace? That's what we really want to look at today. All right, so that's the message of Christmas. Yes, Jesus being born, right. True. What's the real message? Shalom. The shalom of Jesus Christ in your life that pushes out anxiety and chaos. So what does the Bible teach, teach us about it? Here's number one. Peace is a kingdom reality. You know, when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he immediately started preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said that a lot. And if you were to ask people, or if I were to ask you, or whatever, you ask most Christian people, what did Jesus come preaching most people would say, well, salvation. He came preaching salvation. That's not incorrect, but it's not fully, it's not a full truth. <laughs> when you read in the Bible, you never read where it says Jesus came to preach salvation. What you read out of Jesus' own words is, I come to, to preach the kingdom. And that's what it says. He preached the gospel, good news, of the kingdom. That's what he was preaching. Now, within the kingdom of heaven, within the kingdom of God, you can use those interchangeably, which Jesus brought 2,000 years ago, salvation is a part of that. This restoration uh, between God and man, this peace between God and man. Je salvation, he brought that. Salvation is a part of the kingdom reality, right? It's not the whole of it. It's the part of it. And Jesus did teach salvation, and he came to save us. Got that. But his kingdom is, is much broader than that. It's much more overarching than that. Um, Romans 14, 17 is very succinct, and I love it because it, it gives us, a, in just one sentence, what the kingdom is about. That Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, it says this, Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, what, what Paul's saying in here is he said, because the, the Christians had started getting into the, back into this legalism thing. Like, oh, you can't drink that, you can't eat that, you, gotta, you can't do this, you gotta do this. And Paul's like, no. Peter, I mean, all the, all the Bible writers had to address this, but Paul's like, it's not about rules and regulations. I mean, yes, you should live a holy life. Don't get me wrong. But he says it's not about all the eating rules and all the drinking rules. That's not what the kingdom of heaven is about. That's not what Jesus brought. He said what Jesus brought was righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. There's a kingdom right there. So if you're in the kingdom 
And Jesus said, if you, you can't see the kingdom unless you're born again, remember that John 3, he's talking to Nicodemus, uh, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people think that means if you're not born again, you can't go to heaven. That's true. But it's even broader than that. The kingdom is right now, it's, the kingdom is in the hearts of, of men. There's no physical kingdom right now on this earth of Jesus Christ. There will be pretty soon. <laughs> But there's not a geographic kingdom right now, literally, but there's a real kingdom in the hearts of people. I'm a citizen of that kingdom. If you're a believer, you are a citizen of that kingdom now. That's another sermon, but it's biblical. Um, so we're, we're, we're part of the kingdom, and... And it says that there's righteousness, peace, and joy. Talk about joy next week. But we're taught, and righteousness, holy living, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. But this idea of peace, if you're in the kingdom, all right, you should be enjoying peace. You sh peace should be a part of your life. And if you're not, like, okay, what am I, I'm missing something here. Um, one of the things I've learned over time um, it was kind of an aha moment for me, maybe it's not for you because you've, you've known this for a long time, but is that there can be no peace without truth. It takes truth, absolute truth, which Jesus is. Remember Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And John uh, says, uh, the Messiah came, the word became flesh, uh, full of grace and Truth. So Jesus is truth. His kingdom is based on the truth. There can be no peace without truth. When I learned that, I was like, wow. So like, when there are chaotic situations, it's not like, let's call a truce. Like, I've learned that's bad counseling, at least for pastors. Like, let's seek the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what's the truth in this situation? What's going on here, Holy Spirit? Would you reveal the truth to us? And let God, between his written word and his spoken word to our heart, reveal truth to us, because when we get the truth, now we can have peace. And, and so there can be no peace without truth. But again, maybe that's almost another whole sermon. But Jesus is truth, so that we can, we can have peace. But if you're going to have the peace of Christ, then you need to follow the, the truth of Christ. And the truth of Christ, as it relates to his kingdom, because that's the point we're on, um, peace is um, a reality of the kingdom, is um, you're either in the kingdom of God or you're out of it, or even against it. There's no middle ground. People think there's a middle ground. There is not. You are, according to Jesus, if you're not in his kingdom, you're against his kingdom. And that's a truth. And there's so many people that are against his kingdom but want peace. It's like, good luck with that. I mean, if, if you're looking for lack of conflict, maybe if you try really hard and get some really wise men and women in your life, maybe you can have lack of conflict. But if you want that deep shalom from Jesus himself, you're going to have to be part of his kingdom. If you want peace, you'll find it in the kingdom of God because God, uh, because Jesus is not only the king of that kingdom, he's also the prince of peace. So here's number two, things we're learning about peace in the Bible. Number two, peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting as we talk about truth in the last point, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit in the Bible as the Spirit of Truth. He says, I will send you the Spirit of Truth. Now, the Holy Spirit has many different names, Comforter, Counselor, Advocate. Uh, but Spirit of Truth is one name that Jesus used for the, the Holy Spirit. I thought that was interesting. We talk about fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you read, uh, we're not going to read it, but in Galatians um, 5, 20, 21, 22, it lists, lists the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
Oh, now I've got to finish up the rest of them. Uh, okay, I should have written these down. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I missed one. Oh, did I miss one? Goodness. Did I say goodness? Ah, uh, whatever. There's nine. Oh, Don Pardo doesn't get to tell me what I won. Um, only old people laugh at that, right? Don Pardo, tell him what he won. Right? Yeah, never mind. Young people are going like, what do you talk about, old man? Yeah. Go back and watch reruns of Let's Make a Deal or something. Or, um, where was I? So, Galatians 5, talking about the fruit of the Spirit, of which peace is a fruit of the Spirit. When you're fully submitted, yielded, submitted to the Holy Spirit, you will have peace. I used to wrongly work on, my, on the fruit of the Spirit. It's like you'd read the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm, maybe way back in the day, I might even have preached on that. I don't know. I've, good thing it wasn't, we didn't have YouTube back then because I'd have to go delete it. But I, I may have even preached back in the day of you know, working on the fruits of the Spirit. Except that that's not biblical. You can't work on the fruit of the Spirit. You work, if there's such a word, on submitting to the Holy Spirit and yielding to the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit yield or lead you and guide you. When, when, when you do that, when you fully submit to the Holy Spirit, you will have peace. You don't work on having peace. You work on submitting to the Holy Spirit. Yesterday, when I lost my peace for a time and my wife had to suffer the consequences of it, I was not submitted to the Holy Spirit. I was not following the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean I'm going to hell. doesn't mean I'm not saved. doesn't mean any of that. doesn't mean that God doesn't love me. It means that I was not submitted and yielded to the Holy Spirit. I was totally in the flesh. And <laughs> to get my peace back, I had to submit and yield to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it... <laughs> Here's another sermon, but I'll just throw a, a, maybe I can do this in a couple lines. Um, there's not nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. There's one. That one fruit, because it doesn't say the fruits of the Holy Spirit are these nine things. It says the fruit, singular, is this. So it's like, well, I, I have the peace, I just don't have the self-control i got to work on the self-control. No, you don't work on self-control. You work on being submitted to the Holy Spirit and being yielded to the Holy Spirit because it's one fruit. You should have all, all nine of those things. There is one fruit. Again, that's kind of another sermon, but i got to get back to it here. So, I guess maybe to summarize it this way, you can't work on producing fruit. You submit to the Holy Spirit. Okay, your job is not to produce fruit. Your job is to stay connected to the vine. Jesus said that in John 15. He says, I'm the vine. You're the branches. If, if you stay connected to me, you're going to produce fruit. That's what Jesus said. If you don't stay connected, you won't produce fruit. It's pretty simple. And you stay connected to Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And so you need that connection to Jesus. So it's not your job to make fruit. It's your job to stay connected to the vine. All right, number three. Peace protects us. <laughs> it's kind of a hard concept to understand, I'll try, I, I, but I, I think I can explain it. Um, a lot of you have read this verse. This is Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Um, I grew up in the Lutheran church. A lot of you knew that. But in the Lutheran church, it's known as a liturgical church. In other words, there's a liturgy. There's, there's, you open the book and you read stuff. Sometimes it's responsively. Sometimes you, you know, read it in unison. Sometimes the pastor would say something and you'd say something. And, and I grew up from, well, from birth, hearing that every Sunday, and I was just hearing syllables. But, but over time, you, you pick these phrases up, which I'm appreciative for. And I remember in Lutheran church, this was one they said every Sunday. It's like, and the peace that passes understanding will guard your, 
That was peace that passes understanding, not surpasses. But the peace that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I mean, I, I didn't even know that was a Bible verse when I was little. I, I remember when I got older and like, I should probably memorize some Bible verses. I realized I already had some memorized that I didn't even know were Bible verses. And this was one of them. But the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your hearts and mind. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the passes understanding, but when, you, when, when Jesus gives you the gift of peace, when that comes into your life, it often doesn't make sense that you have it. I mean, there, when there are storms, when you're in a storm of life, and you're feeling just battered around, and all of a sudden you get the peace of Jesus, that shalom that comes, it's like, whoa, I... I mean, the storm is swirling around you, but you're in a place of peace. It's like, if you think about it, like, now this doesn't make sense. I mean, in the natural, I, I've, I've shared this with you. Um, well, I'll share this in a minute because I don't want to overshare. Okay, got to move on. Um, so we can't comprehend it. It's like, whoa, because it's a supernatural work, really, of of the Holy Spirit. So how does peace protect you? It it protects our hearts and minds. When your life is full of anxiety and chaos, it's a huge open door for the enemy. When there's anxiety in your life, when there's chaos, things are stirred up, it's like the enemy's perfect because they're not paying attention. They're focused on the storm. I'm going to come in, and this is a great opportunity for me to start stirring the pot, make things worse. And, and we don't even see it because we're so focused on other things. It's like Peter. Uh, remember, walk, uh, there's the storm swirling around, and he's scared, and Jesus is, uh, they see somebody walk on the water, they don't, know it's, they don't know it's Jesus right away. They think it's a ghost, and they get more scared because now not only is there a storm, they might drown it, but now there's a ghost walking in it. And they see it's Jesus, oh, whew, it's you, master. And Peter goes, if that's you, let me walk out on the water to, to, to you. And Jesus is like, well, come on. You know that story? And Peter jumps out of the boat, walking on the water, because he's looking at Jesus. But what happens? As soon as he starts, the Bible says, so he looked at the wind and the waves. He started looking around at the storm around him, sinks like a rock. And that's, exact, that's a picture of this it's like when we're focused on Jesus, we have his peace, we're protected. But as soon as we, as soon as we start looking at the storm and get, let the anxiety and the chaos of the world swirl and we start paying attention to that, the enemy's there just stirring it up and tweaking it and, and, make, and amplifying it. And so when we have that peace, we're protected from that. Does that make sense? Because I'd wondered for a long time, how does that protect you? It just sounded like flowery and nice. I didn't want to search. I guess I didn't want to study it out. Finally, no, I got, I got to find out what this means. And that's what it means. It's like, basically, if you're filled, I mean, here's a better way to say it. If you're filled with the shalom of Jesus Christ, there's not room for the enemy to work. He, he can't get it. There's just no room. You have to get rid of the peace and open up to anxiety and chaos. And then, oh, man, there's lots of room then. All right. Um, number four, we are, meaning you and me, we are to be carriers of peace. That's possible. When you, when you are full of the peace of Jesus, the shalom, when you have that, there's like, there's like a, if I can, at the risk of using a new age term, Okay, but just hang with me. There's like an aura around you. And not really visible necessarily, obviously, but like an atmosphere. Remember on Charlie Brown, Pigpen? Was it Pigpen? Walking around, you saw the oh, it's dirt swirling around him, right? Poor Pigpen. <laughs> so uh, politically incorrect nowadays. He couldn't do that now. But remember, they had this sort of atmosphere around him. But when you have the peace of Jesus, you have this atmosphere that's around you and people kind of pick up on that, usually subconsciously. 
I've told you this story a, a, a lot. Some of you haven't heard it, though, but my wife and I were in uh, Las Vegas, uh, and we were at a mall, and we were waiting for the shuttle bus back, and Donna was still shopping, which is usually the other way around because she's the saver, I'm the shopper, but she was shopping, so like, God bless her, go for it. And uh, so I'm sitting at the bus stop, waiting for the shuttle bus, had the misters, you know, I've been to the hot places, they missed in the fam. I'm like, oh, it feels so good. And I'm sitting there at the end of the bench by myself, and another lady, maybe I'm a little older than me, sits down at the end of the bench, and I just kind of look over and nod, you know, say hi, pleasant, and didn't want to creep her out or anything. So sitting there looking straight ahead, and all of a sudden she goes, pardon me, sir, are you a man of God? And I'm like, it's just like, is this, am I being set up? I'm like, um, I didn't know how to answer. I'm like, um, well, I'm a pastor. She goes, oh, well, you just have this peace all around you. I'm like, oh, well, thanks. And then the bus came and we, but it's, um, and I don't always have that peace, right? Okay, I'm not, say, I'm not saying, dun, 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 you know, <laughs> but, but, and I wasn't, I was not, working on my peace. I'm just like sitting there. You can be yielded and submitted to the Holy Spirit with, it's just without working at it. You understand what I'm saying? But again, there wasn't a lot of things swirling around, so it was maybe easier to have peace, and we were kind of on vacation, so that makes it a lot easier to have peace, right? To, to, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying people notice that. I remember years and years ago, a friend of mine uh, lived around here, Mark Workman, some of you know him, but a great Christian guy and uh, full of the Holy Spirit, and there was a a clerk at the store, and and Mark would go in there almost every day, and this was when we lived here the first time way back in the day, and you know, I'd go in there, and after several months of Mark going in and out, this Mark had left, and I go to pay for my stuff, and she goes, who is that guy? I go, well, that's, that's Mark Workman. He goes, she, she said, um, he's a Christian, isn't he? And she was just kind of investigate. I mean, she, she would call herself a Christian, but wasn't. I mean, I mean she knew she wasn't. I, I don't want to get complicated. She later became a Christian, okay? Is that good enough? Um, but she's like, because he, he's got such a peace about him. And so the next time he comes in, she's like, what church do you go to? <laughs> and he was having to go to our church in, when I was at Shoto. And, um, and uh, anyway, so it wasn't too long she showed up there and serving the Lord. It's just an awesome story. But I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that you are a carrier of peace. And when you carry that peace, there are not everybody, but there are people who are like, whoa, I don't know what that is, but I want some of that. Some people see it as peace. Some people, like, I don't, they see it as something else. Like, but it's attractive, okay? That's, that's, maybe that's a better way to say it. But you can actually, you carry that peace, and you can leave that peace. I mean, not, <laughs> you get filled up again, but I mean, you can, you can um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, download some of that peace in the area around you if people are willing. Here's what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 10. So Jesus had sent out like the 12 disciples. Now he's sending out like 72, all right? He's, he's expanding the kingdom. They're advancing the kingdom. And what is in the kingdom? Peace, right? Righteousness, joy, peace, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says this. So he's giving them instructions. When you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. What it means worthy, if like people there like see what you have and they want that, it's like, pfft, download it. Bless them. Give them that peace that comes through Jesus. If they're not, if they're like, don't want any part of that, like don't, you can't force that on them. You, you can, people, again, this, this is biblical of what we've seen happening uh, is that when people see that, there are going to be people in your life, when you're a carrier of peace, they're like, I don't know what you have, but I want some of that. And, and we're, we're to be carriers of that so that people, so we can give that away. So, 
Bottom line is God wants you to be filled with his peace. His peace. Not the peace of the world, but the peace that passes understanding. Um, And like I said earlier, if you want the peace of God that I'm talking about, you need to have peace with God. And if you're here this morning and you've, you've never made peace with God through Jesus Christ, I'm inviting you to do that. And what that means is, all you're really doing is acknowledging Jesus as Lord and Savior. You're acknowledging Jesus as the one who forgives your sins. And when you acknowledge Jesus, which we call salvation, Jesus called it being born again, you're saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm out of relationship with God the Father. And I want to be in relationship, and I know I can, on- I can only do that through you. So today, Jesus, I come through you and I give you all my sin and I accept your righteousness. I, I'm in your kingdom, Lord. It's just that profession, that confession of faith that you trust in Jesus. When you do that, Jesus makes you, you have peace with the Father, which he wants. He wants that for you. It's his good will for you to have that peace. And when you get the peace with God, then you can have the peace of God. And that will change your life. So as we close this morning, I, I encourage you, if you've not made that profession of faith, if you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus, I'm asking you to do that. And because Jesus will take the ball and run with it and he makes peace between you and the Father. So you can have peace with God, so you can have the peace of God. One other piece of advice, this is, again, a story I've shared a lot, but it's so important, I need to share it with you. I'll give you the shortened version. When my dad died unexpectedly, very suddenly, um, I was obviously stirred up. A lot of anxiety, a lot of chaos, you know, like, whoa, what's... And without even asking for it, all of a sudden I felt this incredible peace come on me. Like I couldn't even, if I, if I couldn't have got out of the chair if I would have tried. It was the most incredible peace I've ever felt in my life. I mean, I just can't even explain it. It's a peace that passes understanding. I can't even explain it to you. Every cell in my body had shalom. I didn't ask for it. I totally didn't expect it. And I enjoyed it for about four seconds, five seconds. I'm like, because I didn't realize that God had given, you know, I didn't realize what was going on. I'm like, what am I doing? My dad just died. I got to be all stirred up. And so I tried to, I was stirring all that up again, because that's the way you're supposed to feel, right? And the Lord spoke to me, not audibly, but he spoke to my heart and he said, Mike, I just gave you that peace as a gift. Don't feel guilty about having that. And I think so many people feel guilty about having peace in the midst of a storm. I'm, I'm here to tell you what God told me is he's going to, in the midst of the storm, you can have peace. He wants you to have peace. You should have peace. But a lot of times we don't receive it because we don't think we should have it. Like, no, i got to be stirred up. If I'm all stirred up, I, I, I'm... I'm not concerned. I don't care. I, you know what I'm saying? It's like, no. You can be concerned and still have peace. You can be sad and still have peace. You can grieve and have peace. And God wants that for you. No matter what situation you're in, he wants you to have peace. And he doesn't want you to feel guilty about that. So today, I believe I just, I, it's God's will that you receive that deep peace, that shalom, that passes understanding he wants that for you and and we're going to give you a chance to receive that today so if you need to receive Jesus as Savior first do that but otherwise if you've done that just receive a download of his peace today in fact why don't you stand up and I want to pray that for you before I pray that I forgot almost forgot during worship at the beginning of church I was sitting over there 
and I felt like the Lord spoke to me a word of knowledge, and I just want to share that because it goes along with this, uh, I believe. Uh, it was very clear um, that somebody in here or watching online um, or both, you've been praying for a reconciled relationship. You have a relationship, I don't know if it's family or friend, I don't know, it doesn't matter, that's been broken or strained. And the Lord, to show me clear as a bell, he's putting that back together. He's reconciling this relationship that you've been praying and thinking there's no way it's going to be reconciled, but I'm going to pray for it anyway. And the Lord wants you to know today, if that's you, it's, hap it's, it's happening, it's coming soon. Just do your part, <laughs> and he'll, he'll make the rest happen. So I just want to give you, as a way of encouragement, if that's you, receive that today. Because he's not only bringing peace between you and him, and peace in your heart. He's bringing peace between you and some of those broken relationships. So receive that if that's you today. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I just pray that you fill everyone with your peace here today. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. And you said that you came to bring us peace, not like the world gives, but what you give. So Lord, I'm asking you to give that now. That as we, your people, are standing before you with a heart of worship and an open heart and a vulnerable heart that's open to you, Lord, that, that you would just pour in your peace. Flood us with the peace that passes understanding that would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your peace. We receive it now in Jesus' name. We're going to continue in worship another 10 or 15 minutes as we do. I want you to receive that peace. We're actually going to sing a, a song of blessing for you to receive that peace. But if you need prayer for anything, I know some people don't want to get close to people, and we totally respect that. If you want prayer but you want to get close to somebody, send us a prayer request. Fill out the prayer card or tell us from a distance. But if, if, if you're okay coming up to a prayer person, um, they'd be glad to pray for any need you have. Maybe it's a reconciled relationship. Whatever it is, maybe it's financial needs, health, whatever you need a touch from God this morning, these prayer time people are up here to pray that for you. So feel free to come to them in prayer as we uh, continue on in worship this morning.